Hello friends, Dr. David Katz, back with you for another COVID reality check because I have something to say. Uh, first, a quick update. I am now going on seven weeks since the start of my COVID symptoms and overwhelmingly better, but not totally done with it. Uh, my sense of smell olfaction is back about 40 to at most 50%. And it continues to wax and wane. I don't know if others of you who've had COVID experienced that. I, I had the impression if it went away and started to get better, it would just continue to get better. But I've kind of had two steps forward, one step back, where some days it's working well, and then I, I seem to lose it again. So that's been interesting. And, and I continue to have fatigue and intermittent headaches. So not quite totally done. So again, uh, for someone who is in good health uh, and you know who's not at a very advanced age I, I think for the most part the expectation was right that that COVID would be a, a relatively mild illness but far from insignificant not a walk in the park and uh, I'm, I'm really eager to get back to baseline and conferring with colleagues who, who are healthy and in my age group who've had it as well this is the experience, a couple months uh, to, to get over it fully. And I've had the flu before, and, and it wasn't like this. So um, interesting experience and uh, definitely a disease that deserves our respect. Uh, what I wanted to, I, I guess, you know, you might be interested in, in more commentary from me about uh, vaccines. I, I, you know, I think there's so much information in circulation there. I don't have a, a lot to append. What I can say is that it's my expectation that the good vaccines will be robust against a diversity of strains. It's always possible there'll be the emergence of some strain. There's concerns about the one in South Africa now that, that may manage to navigate around immunity from prior infection uh, or may navigate around the defenses that are conferred by uh, vaccines. But by and large, the, the vaccines should confer at least significant partial protection against all strains. These strains are all variations on a common theme. I addressed that last time. My, my view on that hasn't changed. And I, I, I think there were questions about my personal status. I do intend to get vaccinated. Uh, for one thing, there's some evidence. It's limited. There's not a lot in the literature yet, but there's some evidence that that boost your immune response can accelerate the completion of recovery. So I, I've been tested. I have IgG to SARS-CoV-2. I am immune, and yet I continue to have some symptoms. And again, some, some evidence that that boost in the immune response may speed the exit of these residual symptoms. I, I'm eager for that, and that would be a reason to get vaccinated sooner than later. So I'm on the list. It hasn't been all that easy to get access here in Connecticut. Still working on it. My, my age group just became eligible. Uh, but my wife and I are, are in the queue and, uh, and plan to get vaccinated. Because we both had COVID, we just need one shot, whichever version. So the, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is a one and done anyway. Moderna and Pfizer, as you know, are both two doses. But if you've had the infection, one dose will do. That, that's my plan. Uh, and you know, I'm quite confident about it. My, my views on the, the vaccines, the value proposition of immunization in general, I, I've shared before. Those of you who are dug in and, and you know, are wary of vaccines, I, I doubt I'll convert you in these few minutes. Um, I've written extensively on the topic over the years and, and shared my views on, on why I think immunization uh, you know, is, is generally a, a very good idea. Um, but you know, again, I, I think um, there are valid questions about the, the specifics of these vaccines. We don't know what they're going to do over a 10-year span. And, and that is a reason to have some care and concern in making your selection, do your homework. But, you know, every time I've encountered that objection, I've pointed out, yeah, but if you don't get vaccinated, you're at greater risk of getting the infection. And we don't have a 10-year experience with the infection either. What might the virus do 10 years later. And, and, and by the way, that's a very common concern. I think I alluded to this last time. Uh, there are a number of viral infections that precipitate long-term consequences. Uh, in, in my clinical work over the years, we've implicated past viral exposures in fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, uh, a range of autoimmune conditions. They act as a trigger. So we can't assume that having a virus is devoid of long-term consequences. 
And that has to be factored into the way you weigh up risks and benefits related to the vaccine. I, I've done the math for me and, and for my family. I'm thoroughly convinced that the vaccine is the way to go. I, I would have gladly gone there before getting COVID, but I got COVID. And so it'll be a post-infectious vaccine for me. The, the topic I particularly wanted to address today, it's been much in the news of late, is the issue of demystifying COVID mortality in some countries versus others. Uh, you know, th this has been coming up in the peer-reviewed literature where there was a recent paper in the Journal of the American Heart Association on cardiometabolic risk factors for COVID. I will, of course, link to that. Colleagues of mine have been working on that topic. We've been doing an analysis at the True Health Initiative, looking at the various factors that account for variations in the casualty toll around the world. But in particular, there was commentary uh, on this issue of the, the mystery of the low rate of COVID mortality in African and Asian countries in the New York Times at the start of this week by David Leonhardt, a columnist there. And if you flip that around, wondering why is mortality low in some relatively low income countries in Africa and Asia, that, that question on the flip side is why is mortality so high in some high income countries like the US, the UK, and, and much of Western Europe? And frankly, I think that's the question. I, I think we want to know why is mortality high where it's high. And uh, to put it bluntly, I think obesity and chronic disease are the explanation. And I, I continue, and, and you know, I, I, I call upon all of you. This, this I hope, is a, something of a community. I appreciate those of you who come here to, to listen and to comment. So to whatever extent we're a community and we're capable of collective action, pay this idea forward, please, that we came into this pandemic. I'm referring to the United States in particular, but frankly, many developed countries had the same epidemiology. We came into this pandemic mired in a pandemic. We had a pandemic of obesity totally preventable. We actively propagate it for profit in this country. We had a pandemic of type 2 diabetes and hypertension and dyslipidemia and coronary disease. And these have been hiding in plain sight forever. Uh, that's that's a career-long frustration for me, and, and we don't have to explore every nook and cranny of that. But, but, but here's the thing. Ask yourself, how much have you heard from anybody other than perhaps me across the entire sweep of, of this tortuous pandemic experience about the opportunity to defend ourselves against this acute threat via coordinated health promotion campaigns, community health promotion campaigns? Uh, faith-based community uh, health promotion campaigns, uh, employer-mediated health promotion campaigns, mediated via Zoom. Let's do fitness classes together. Let's teach one another healthy recipes. Let, if we're all going to get together via Zoom, let's get together via Zoom and pursue health together. Statewide campaigns to promote health. Let, let's take stock of the risk factors for bad COVID outcomes in our state the prevalence of obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, coronary disease. It's high. Folks, let's get together and do something about that because if we can ameliorate these cardiometabolic risk factors, there will be an acute reduction in the toll of COVID. Fewer people will die in upcoming months. And it will also be the gift that keeps on giving because healthy people have more fun. Vitality uh, is, is one of the greatest gifts we can confer upon one another. Let's do that. Let's pursue that together. And, of course, there was the opportunity for a national campaign. And it's the one area I keep waiting to hear something about from the Biden task force. And, and I really haven't. And, and I've, I've submitted this recommendation to my friends on the task force, but have yet to hear anything back. And, you know, I, I think the question is why. So I, I don't think the mortality differential between affluent countries like the U.S. and, and significantly less affluent countries in, in Africa and Asia is a great mystery. Uh, frankly, they're younger. Age is a major risk factor for COVID. They have significantly less obesity and chronic disease, and those are the major risk factors for bad COVID outcomes. Uh, interestingly, by the way, uh, the, the real paradox of obesity epidemiologically is that in affluent countries, obesity tracks with relative indigence, 
and social and economic disadvantage. In relatively indigent countries, obesity tracks with affluence and social and economic advantage. The epidemiology is totally flipped around. So it's flipped around first because obesity is common here, rare there, but it's affecting totally different segments of the population too. So any, any look across countries at the impact of obesity is the classic apple-orange comparison, totally different scenario. But here, where obesity is hyper-endemic, it's a major risk factor for bad COVID outcomes, and, and it's a major risk factor along a number of pretty well-plotted mechanistic pathways. I, I, I'm attaching my latest column on all of this, and I provide more detail there and, and links to relevant sources. But just in brief, one whole network of pathways is metabolic. So heightened inflammatory responses, impaired immune system responses, impaired vascular responses, so a number of metabolic effects of obesity. But the other pathways are strictly mechanical. Severe obesity, and, and the more severe the obesity, the greater the association with bad COVID outcomes, hospitalization, ICU death. The more severe obesity is, the more it impairs respiratory excursions. So the measure of how much air you're moving with each, with each breath called tidal volume actually goes down with severe obesity. When I was on the front lines briefly, we, we saw the immediate benefit of repositioning patients with COVID who had respiratory distress. That's really hard to do when someone's really big and on, an, on a gurney in the emergency department. It was hard for the patient. It was hard for the staff. So, so they were getting repositioned less often, less effectively, not, not for want of trying, but for want of success. Some physicians were, were just not comfortable for them. Lying on their stomachs, for example, didn't necessarily work. Uh, so mechanical liabilities associated with obesity. So the mechanisms are clear. The association is strong. And, and to be clear, obesity is not the fault of individuals. It is a liability of our culture. We actively propagate it for profit. And it's entirely unfair to rely on personal responsibility as the remedy when large corporations working for big food are hiring teams of scientists to design food people can't stop eating until their arm gets exhausted from lifting it to their mouths. Remember the Lay's potato chip ad, bet you can't eat just one? Well, that, that was a threat. And Michael Moss, a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative journalist, has written about the addictive properties of junk food willfully engineered to foster overeating because the more we eat, the more we buy, the more we buy, the more we spend, the more we spend, the more they make. And somebody's laughing about hyperendemic obesity all the way to the bank. It's just not you and me. So in any event, uh, I don't think there's a mystery about the high mortality toll of this pandemic in the United States because we came into this pandemic with others. And if there's going to be any advantage of all we've been through this past year, it's the fact that the acute pandemic has shown a bright light on the chronic pandemic we've long been ignoring and gives us a whole new reason to address it. So for me, the mystery if there is any, is not the high mortality toll of COVID here. The mystery is the lack of outrage that so many of these deaths could have been avoided if we weren't actively propagating obesity and chronic disease for profit in this country. And if you and I and the people we talk to and the people they talk to and enough of us start to care about that, then at long last, maybe we can fix it. All right, I will attach relevant links, and as ever, uh, I wish you well, stay safe, and if I've got something I think is worth saying, I'll be back. Until then.